Okay, um, I'd like to welcome everybody and thank everybody for coming here tonight. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Steve Buckley and John Farrell join us here at RMHS and um, have a discussion here about athletics and high school sports and, and, and sportsmanship and, and baseball in general. So um, just very, very quickly, the organization that put this together is the Friends of Reading Baseball. It's a new organization that's been started this year and it is uh, you know, just kind of getting off the ground, but is you know, anticipating doing events like this in the future and, and trying to uh, you know, promote baseball in the community and also support uh, the high school program as best they can. So uh, the, all the people that were manning the tables and kind of standing around in the back as you came in, those are the, the board members. And I just want to thank them and, and, and uh, you know, appreciate uh, everything that they're doing for us up at the high school. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is bring out Steve Buckley. Steve Buckley is uh, obviously a writer with the Boston Globe Herald, and um, he is going to introduce John and take over from there. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I'm going to make this quick because you came to see John Farrell, not me. And uh, so what I'll do is rather than talk about myself, I'll talk about the manager of the Red Sox. I've actually known John for 30 years. In 30 years this uh, summer that I first met John, I was covering the, uh, the main guides, the AAA farm team for the uh, Cleveland Indians. I was working for the Portland Press Herald, and very late in the season, the main guides needed pitching, and the farm director was a guy named Bob Quinn, and they took a uh, very highly regarded prospect uh, from single-A Waterloo, uh, Waterloo in the Midwest League, and they called John Farrell up, I think he was 22 years old, to AAA, and he ended up, I think, starting one of the games in the Governor's Cup playoffs. Within a few years, he was in the big leagues, and uh, as his manager, Doc Edwards, has told me many times, uh, he'd have had one phenomenal career if he didn't have injuries. And he went into player development. He was a farm director of the Cleveland Indians. He famously became the pitching coach of the Red Sox when they won the World Series in 2007 manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, and of course is now manager of the Red Sox and they won the World Series. So when you consider high school baseball, college baseball, minor league baseball, big league baseball, farm director, big league pitching coach, big league manager, World Series winning manager, this is a guy who has been around baseball really at every single conceivable level and can speak on all different levels, and also he has a couple of World Series rings. So, with that introduction, it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce the manager of the Boston Red Sox, John Farrell. Is, is this on here? Can you hear this? Okay. One quick side story to that introduction after uh, first meeting Steve in, in Old Orchard Beach. I, I was 0-6 in A-ball. I remember getting called in by a manager, it was Gomer Hodge at the time, and he had said, you're, you're moving on up, you're getting out of here, uh, or, or, or we're making a move with you. And keep in mind that the, probably the four days prior to this meeting, I was ejected out of the game, because I think frustrations had gotten to the point where uh, there, there was a tag, there was a rundown between second and third, I was involved in it, called in our way, I get ejected in like the second inning. So, Add insult to injury, and they called me and said, hey, we're, we're, we're making a move. And at the time, our double-A team was in Buffalo. Uh, our rookie ball team was in Batavia, which is just outside of Buffalo. Buffalo was in first place, and so quickly, as, as these thoughts are racing through my mind, they're, you know, I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going, I'm moving up. I've got to be going down. 0-6, all that. Gomer Hodge says, catch a flight in the morning. You're going to Portland to join Old Orchard Beach. And I looked at him and I said, are you sure? <laughs> 0 6, I, was, I had just been drafted in June, and this was early August. Uh, so that's a little prelude to the, the sidebar to what Steve mentioned about first meeting up in Maine. So uh, I thought, though, what I would like to do is give you a little bit, bit of background, because I think it weaves into what we're trying to, the message that we're trying to get across here tonight. What the game has afforded me, not just a career for myself, my family, a journey that is hopefully still going on for quite a while. Uh, and then get into some other points uh, that might be appropriate to the, to the guys and girls that are, that are in this building here tonight. Uh, but I think the fact that it's Father's Day, which we're, Stevie's in here, and I, I remember agreeing to this, and I thought, this is about four or five weeks ago when we finalized the date. It's like, yeah, it's June 15th. 
and, and about three days ago, I, I realized it's Father's Day on June 15th here, so we're glad to share it with you here tonight. Um, that being said, the fact that it is Father's Day, in my background, uh, I have so much to be thankful for for what my dad exposed me to. The mentor that he was for me, my role model, uh, he was a minor league pitcher. He was injured before he got to the big leagues, got to the double A level, which was in the Eastern League. Uh, and so baseball has been in our family, generations of it. And the fact that he was the one that took me aside, and keep in mind, this is in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and I grew up in New Jersey, on the beach in New Jersey, about an hour south of New York City. So my idol was Tom Seaver. And even to this day, I have a large picture of him in the office at Fenway. He was the guy that I emulated my pitching delivery off of. He was the guy that became somewhat the telescraper. Keep in mind, in the late 60s, there was no video. I'm not going to YouTube and pull up someone's video to take a look. So as games were going on, my dad used him as the, as the example uh, to the early pitching career, the, or the journey that I started to travel down uh, as a pitcher. So in that time, it was you know, very much a drop and drive style delivery. It was unique to him. It was kind of a sign of the times. But the fact that I was able to forge a relationship early on with my father that I, I didn't realize was happening was pretty cool. So baseball is the thread between my dad and I. He was also a, a lobster fisherman, a commercial fisherman. So as a fourth grader, when I started to work for him, I was taught a work ethic from an early stage. Uh, we dealt with hardship. We dealt with bankruptcy that ultimately took him out of the fishing industry. But I also see, saw him deal with people when things were going well and when things weren't going well. So the work ethic that he instilled in me, uh, the way he dealt with people, uh, little did I know at the age of you know eight, nine, ten years old that I was starting to live and, and see firsthand some of the things that I could hope to pass on to my three boys, uh, two of which are still pro playing in pro baseball. The oldest is in double-A with the White Sox. Uh, the middle one who, uh, unfortunately, his career ended with a shoulder surgery. He's in the scouting department with the Chicago Cubs uh, in Wrigley, in the, an office there. And my youngest was taken last year by the Royals uh, and is in the South Atlantic League as a pitcher uh, with Kansas City Royals chain. So I'm hopeful that in some small way I can pass on some of those characteristics that my, my dad instilled in me, um, and more importantly, dealing with things when they don't go well. And, and I think that's, in, in our world, Steve mentioned that having been a, a player, coach, or coached in college at my alma mater at uh, Oklahoma State for five years, before going back to Cleveland and, and being in the front office as the director of player development, you get more of a, a sense of a person when things aren't going well. You see their true colors come out. Uh, you see in the, in the face of adversity, how are they handling things? How are they um, staying in the moment or staying with a, a routine that has been entrenched in them? Hopefully get them through some tough times. So the things that I saw my dad go through when we were scuffling, when we couldn't make ends meet, I, I like to tell the story that we didn't have two nickels to rub together, but we ate lobster all the time. It was, great. <laughs> it was kind of backwards in a way, but somehow it seemed to work out that way. Um, and I'm hopeful that some of those same lessons, those, you know, the school of hard knocks, I think, hardens people and, and teaches you a way to uh, stay humble, uh, but respect those that are around you and, and know the true value of, uh, I think, an honest day's work. So when I think of my background, um, and I think of some of those humble beginnings, there's no question that has laid the foundation to Keep working when things don't look well, they don't look optimistic, but you keep grinding through some op through some situations. We're going through it right now at Fenway, I can tell you that. Uh, if, and before the night is over, if anybody's got any clues or any help on hitting the front of this conversation, please don't hold back because it, it has been frustrating, to say the least. But as I mentioned, some, some of my background, a lot of my background, has, has afforded me and, and really put a, a foundation in place uh, to hopefully continue to learn about myself, uh, help others around me, uh, but more importantly, kind of stay grounded and know that you know what you're only going to get out of what you're only going to get out of a situation what you put into it, and that's through a lot of hard work, and I think that's through a lot of commitment to, towards 
whatever goal that is you have established. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this game has afforded an incredible journey uh, from leaving the shore of New Jersey to going to school at Oklahoma State University, uh, where I was fortunate to meet my wife there, uh, and then obviously the three boys that we've been able to raise since then. But the, the journey that it's allowed us to travel uh, from you know, the, the four years of college there, which I will say that as we're in this high school tonight, there were three times in my life that I had to make key decisions and school was the altar. And I chose a school each time. Having been drafted by the Oakland A's out of high school in the ninth round, uh, and it's funny because when the, uh, the Cardinals, or not, not the Cardinals, the Reds were in town earlier uh, this year. Walt Jockety is now the, the GM of the Reds. In 1980, he was the scouting director for the Oakland Athletics. I got a call the night of a athletic awards dinner at our, at our high school from Walt Jockey. And it was the day of the draft. I had never met him until about um, three or four weeks ago here in Fenway. So it was kind of a cool thing. And, I, and he remembered it. He remembered my name, the whole thing. It was, it was kind of a neat interaction on the field in Fenway that 30 years prior or 34 years prior was drafted by the Oakland Athletics. The fortunate thing was, it was the last year Charlie Finley owned the A's, and I may be talking me out of turn here. I don't know how many people know the history of some of the, uh, some of the teams, but Charlie Finley, was the, that was the last year he owned the team. So when Walt Jockney sent me my first contract as a possibly signing it, I opened it up with this great anticipation. I remember talking to my dad, if I get X amount, I'm gonna go play pro ball. That was my goal. I, I really didn't have any thoughts of going on to college coming in, in, in my high school year. <laughs> I open up the envelope, the contract says sign bonus, X, X, X. Nothing. <laughs> I thought, this is a pretty easy decision for me. Off to Oklahoma State I go. Drafted in the 16th round after my junior year by the Indians. I, and I felt like, you know what, with a decent year I can improve the status. Chose to go back to school once again, take them in the second round of the year, the, the following year, uh, and continue, or started out a, at that time, a 13 year playing career professionally that ended in mid-year, or at the All-Star break in 95, excuse me, 96. And not knowing what my next step was, I knew I wanted to stay in the game at some point, and yet I didn't finish my degree at Oklahoma State in four years. So after a 13 year gap, uh, I, we were living outside of Cleveland at the time. I played nine of the 13 years with the Indians, and we still had a home there. So on, fr on Sunday nights, I would fly to Oklahoma City, and on Friday night, I fly back to Cleveland, Ohio for four months to finish my degree. It just so happened in that time, the head coach that I played for in the early 80s, and keep in mind, this is 1996, he stepped down. And not knowing where my next step was going to be, I was graduating in December. I chose to, to go back and accept the job as, as the pitching coach of Oklahoma State and, and recruiting coordinator there. So. The, the, the common thread for those guys who are you know sitting here wondering what your next step is knowing that school was out there you can never go wrong by taking that path it might buy you some time to figure out what you want to do it bought me time i know that uh, so school has always been i don't want to say a secondary decision but an all an option in that and it's never steered me wrong it's been uh, an incredible uh, way things have kind of worked themselves out so with that in mind, the, the baseball path continued to kind of take me back through Oklahoma. Uh, and fortunate after that point, as Steve mentioned, going from there after five years as the coach at Oklahoma State, back to Cleveland as the director of farm, uh, director of player development, which is a pretty unique setup. It's a it's a burnout job, I will say. Fifty staff members, you're in charge of 180 players, and an academy in Venezuela and one in the Dominican Republic. So you're 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 going. Uh, you're going on pretty good. And what I mean by that is, think of it as in the game of baseball, there's a, a, a fireman is putting out fires everywhere. Uh, your cell phone never stops. Uh, you're, you're in the hub of an organization. Players coming down, players coming up. You know, seven teams that you're responsible for. Uh, and, and I always go back to that position. That was probably the greatest learning setting that I ever had. I was there almost six years uh, as the director of player development. And the number of different challenges that are thrown at you, the number of different conflicts that you find yourself in, dealing with people, 
you start to see people in a different light. You begin to see them as what they need rather than what they don't do. Because in our world of baseball, and Steve can probably tell you this, it's easy to pick out what guys don't do well and when they don't do well. That's the easy thing. The tough thing is to see through that and see what a guy does do well. But in those situations where he needs help, and, he, and let's face it, every player, even guys at our level right now, guys that are in our uniform, every player has got a need of some sort. And we think of players in three different ways, mentally, physically, and fundamentally. And if you break it down to that, it kind of sorts through that cloudiness, looking at an individual, you can start to kind of identify where the needs lie. You know, the fundamental side is the, is, is the pitching delivery or the hitting mechanics of, of an individual. The mental side obviously speaks volumes, speaks directly to what it is. And at the major level, the biggest difference between the consistent performer and the one who isn't is the mental side of the game. There's without a doubt, no question about that. And it's so critical for players that want to go on. So the guys that are in here, and if I show of hands, how many players are in here that, from Reading? Anybody? The whole team back there? The one thing that I would strongly recommend that you start to get an idea on is what is your routine to prepare for today's game? That has to become a mantra of yours. And, and right now you might be saying, okay, what is, what is he talking about? What is that routine? And, which is perfectly normal. The, your, whatever lead up drills that you do, either to get ready for a game, whether it's hitting, pitching, fielding, whatever it might be, uh, whatever your routine is, either in the on-deck circle or in the bullpen prior to coming into a game, some of the things that you can begin to identify, hey, this is, this is what describes me as a player. Because I can tell you, the higher you go, the more that this game hopefully takes you somewhere, there's going to be a lot of challenges that get thrown your way. And if you have that routine as a centering point, because we play a game or you're involved in a game that's 70% failure and you're a huge hit, 30% success rate and you're kind of in the cream of the crop. So you're dealing with negativity all the time. And one way to always kind of recenter yourself and find ways to rebuild that confidence because you know, Diego Nava would be a prime example to ask this question to right now. A month ago, where was your state of mind and your confidence level versus right now? What happened in between? The guy that was hitting 130 and overall he's hitting 210 right now, but he's had to come back and hit over 400 to raise his average to that point in the, in the eight, 10 games that he's been back with us. But when you see the way he carries himself, you see the way he steps in the batter's box, you see the way he exudes confidence now versus before. He was beaten before he got in the box a month ago. Now that has been reversed. And I guarantee you he would ask or he would answer that question with, okay, there might have been a small adjustment for this approach at the plate, but he'll talk specifically about the routine that he has to get him back to a starting point where he's confident and he's able to continue on and address whatever situation comes up inside the game. So I can't stress enough to you guys that have aspirations of going on from Reading High School to play in baseball, wherever that might be, it's critical for you guys to get a routine that you can call your own. Because as you're dealt, as you're as you're dealing with a slump, as you're dealing with an injury, uh, anything that might come along at you to, to pull you down, to pull you back, to keep you from thinking that you're the best, you've got to find a way to generate that from within. And that, that's probably the beauty of what the minor leagues taught me. I started out two years, my first full season, the year after Steve Benjamin at the beginning. I went back to double A for two years. So I, I signed, drafted, signed, went to Waterloo, Iowa for about six weeks and then went to Old Orchard Beach, Maine for the remainder of that year. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm a step up from the big leagues. This is gonna happen pretty quick. Well, the next two years I spent in, in AA in Waterbury, Connecticut. Who, well, by the way, if you, and, and I, I hopefully nobody from the Chamber of Commerce is here from Waterbury. <laughs> if you're picking your summer vacation spots, don't pick that place. <laughs> anyway, both years started out one and seven. And Talk about humbling, talk about disappointing, talk about you know, confidence hitting rock bottom. Those were two years that I thought, this is never gonna happen. Fortunately, I, I was able to stay healthy throughout those two years and, and start to figure some things out along the way with some help from other people. 
But it really started to hit home when I centered myself around that routine. That was my consistent starting point. I began to really challenge myself from a physical standpoint. Of, I began to really get into long distance running. So after the day after a start, I would get into five to eight mile runs. And then I started to understand what the mental side of it. And so much reflection of yesterday's game on a run that I would go on, you start to learn about yourself. And I think in the end, that journey through baseball, good, bad, or indifferent, has taught me about probably myself more than anything. Every, every person in here, you've got strengths and limitations. And as a manager now, I've got to get to know what the strengths and limitations are of the players on our team. Hopefully to put them in a position of success or to have success more times than not. That's, that's the beauty of putting that puzzle together every night. Sometimes it doesn't always work, but I think this journey puts us on that course to be able to find out about yourself. It's humbling. It can be scary. And I think more than anything, for you guys that are in situations right now where decisions might be in front of you, when it feels uncomfortable, when that decision that's lying there feels uncomfortable, that to me is growth. That's personal growth. You're, you're entering a spot where you've never been before. You've got to make a decision on something. You've got to make a call on something. And it doesn't feel comfortable. Don't run from that. Don't run from feeling uncomfortable. Embrace it, take it head on, because that uncomfortable, sticking your neck out, you're now experiencing something for the first time. That's growth, that's, so as you young guys are getting ready to kind of maybe target what schools you've got interest in, what your next step would be after high school here, there, that's always gonna be uncertain. But as long as you have a little bit of a routine for your daily preparation, whether it's getting, coming into school here, whether it's getting ready to go on the field. If you've got some of that working for you, some of these decisions that you've got laying out there might not be that daunting. But I think it's important to know that you're gonna put, your, put yourself in an uncomfortable position as, many, as much as you can. To me, that, that's where the real personal growth takes place. So when you go back to who am I, and the work ethic that hopefully is instilled in you or you've learned something along the way. I keep going back to, so you can jump it around here a little bit, but think about getting ready for your season or for any athlete in here, whatever sport that it is that you play. There's an off season that you've got to do a lot of work towards building up for the start of the regular season. Things that you get no reward for. Things that you are doing by yourself when no one's there to guide you, give you recommendations, give you coaching of any kind. You're going to be doing it off on your own. And that's where hopefully some goals that you've got set for yourself and some path or plan that you've kind of laid out for yourself carries you carries the day and takes you to that point. I go back to what I mentioned earlier, working for my dad as a as he was a lobster fisherman. All the work that was done in the off season, during the winter months, getting ready for the spring and summer, I learned early on that you had to do a lot of work and you never got paid for it. But you were hopefully getting, putting yourself into a situation where you could then reap the rewards of summertime. When I was getting ready to you know, go off to college and start to get ready for the upcoming season, I took myself back to those moments, I can't tell you how many times. When you had to get up and run, you had to get up and lift, you had to get up and do all the things that you had to get done to prepare or build that foundation for an upcoming season. There was no benefit. There was no win-loss coming at you. There was no uh, key base hit at a, at a point in time in the game where you got some benefit from it. You were off on your own doing things that no one was watching at the time, but only you yourself were able to see the light and see the goal that flies ahead. So I can tell you this, in conversations with Ben Charrington, when we start to pinpoint the guys that we want to extend long-term or build a team going forward with, you go back and you figure out what is the type of person, not just the player, but what's the type of person that's there. Because these moments I just described, is that guy doing what it takes when no one's around? Is that guy doing what it takes when no one's giving him that guidance? Is he surrounding himself with the right people so that they don't become a distraction? They don't become part of the peer pressure that says, hey, we're all going to this party tonight, you want to go. You've got to make decisions to sacrifice and stay with what your goal is. So when Ben and I start talking about it with, you know, whether it's Dustin Pedroia and, you know, 
Justin, Peeney is, is an easy example because he, he lives, breathes, and sleeps baseball. He makes everybody better around him because of his attitude. His, his attitude is, is infectious. But the reason we always talk about attitude, in my mind, that's a choice. Your attitude is a choice. The day you walk in, you know, the morning that you walk into this building, you have a choice of how you want to react or, or deal with things that get thrown your way. But I think the more you put yourself in positions of having positive people around you, hopefully making decisions that, we know that every decision's got consequence, but hopefully you're, you're making decisions for the right reasons and not because someone's pulling you down a path that you might not otherwise go. Or if you are committed to being the best teammate that you can be, uh, not only for your high school team, but where you might go from there, that, that all comes with a sacrifice. I can, I can think back to going through the minor leagues, finally realizing a dream and getting called to the big leagues in Cleveland. And it would, it would have been, Every, every minor league season, we would go back to New Jersey uh, and live there. I would either work construction or I would get a bartending job or something to make ends meet in the, during the minor league seasons. When we got to Cleveland, we made a commitment. We're going to stay in the city in which we're playing because we wanted to stay in that mindset. So I said, or we said, no, we're not going back to being around family. We decided to stay off on our own just to stay focused and committed towards a window of opportunity. Heck, we never knew how long that major league journey was gonna take. So, I guess the, the thing that I keep coming back to are elements of choice, the decisions that you make, hopefully staying surrounded or surrounding yourself with people that are positive, that are encouraging and aren't trying to pull at you. And that really becomes a challenge for our guys now. You guys who come to the big leagues for the first time, you let's say, a guy comes from very humble beginnings where you know, their, their family is, is a blue collar family or it's an inner city type of situation. All of a sudden they walk in a big league clubhouse and now they're making a half a million bucks right away. And they've come from not much. Well, all of a sudden, they've got friends they never knew they had. They've got family that they haven't heard from in years. And they have to have the ability to say no. No to the fact of, yeah, you want to help others out, but at the same time, you've got to stay focused because it can be a very short-lived situation. And that really becomes hard, guys. You see, you see guys have struggles with that. They want to be everybody's friend. They want to do all the right things. All of a sudden, they start getting pulled apart and they get taken away from that routine that I mentioned that becomes your calling card. As soon as things happen, take away from that routine, that's where guys have to pull the reins in and get back to ground zero and really start to stay disciplined the best they can and focus towards getting prepared for that day. So it starts with a work ethic. It gets manifested or, or it's challenged every day by, by the attitude that we choose to have and the decisions we ultimately make. And then the commitment that lies to or, or stems from the plan that you set out to do or the goals that you've set for yourself. So, so many people will say, oh my gosh, what a, what a great and unique opportunity for guys to get to the big leagues. You must have just incredible talent. Part of that is true. But I will tell you that there are as many stories of guys never making it with more talent because they didn't stay committed to their own plan or they didn't make the right decisions. Or in the light of adversity, they kind of went off the rails a little bit. Um, you know, dealing with injury is one of the things that, that we have to deal with almost, well, it can be sometimes in every year. Uh, Stephen mentioned at the outset, I, unfortunately, I, I ended up having two Tommy John surgeries that in and of itself sounds not like a whole lot of fun, which it wasn't, but if the desire was to continue to play, the decision of rehabbing and going through the surgery, that was, that was made for me. That decision was made for me because I didn't feel like it was over uh, and you wanted to continue on. So if this is what it took to get your elbow repaired, to continue the, you know, the 12 to 14 months of rehab to get back, those are easy decisions. But there's those challenges that continue to get thrown at you. And I, and I know that I'm probably speaking to that group back there directly a little bit more than others, but there, there's a lot of carryover, there's a lot of parallels to any other walk of life that we are involved in. 
There's going to be things that are thrown our way that we don't like, and do we, you know, put our tail between our legs and run from it, or do we find a way to drive through it and know what's on the other side that is something very positive? So um, I go back to those basic elements. You know, a work ethic can never leave you no matter what you do. The people that you choose to be around are critically important and not pulling apart uh, or pulling you away from what your, your goal is hopefully set out and really focalize and crystallize on what you want to do. If there are those around you, that's, you, that's where the ability, to, the, the need of the ability to say no uh, really comes into play. That, that, that can be hard to do. Because then the peer pressure, well, you know what, you're, you're not one of us anymore. You're too good for us, you're moving on. Well, you know what? In some ways, yeah, you are moving on. And that might not be just in the game of baseball or, or any other sport, that might be in any other thing you that you choose to get involved in. But if you have that commitment to those elements, um, you can continue to work through it and work towards a, a, an ultimate goal. And, and I don't, I don't want to get into some, too much um, you know, basic you know, visualization, goal setting, all that. I was fortunate to be involved with a, a college coach, Gary Ward, that he was a center. And he was, uh, I, w I was playing ba college baseball at a time where there weren't nearly the restrictions that there are now. There were, you know, we had the ability to play 40 to 50 games in the fall, another 75 in the, in the spring. But after our fall workouts in the, in the day, he used to take us in a, in a classroom in the auditorium for three hour goal setting classes. And I thought, this guy is out of his mind. <laughs> we would listen to motivational tapes, we would make lists, we would write down all these types of things. We would, and I look back, and it was one of the most impactful four years of my life being involved in it because it started to take the thought, the cloudiness of you know, an 18 to 20 year old, 18 to 21 year old, and really start to crystallize and focus on things. So part of being around the people that will influence you and make a positive impact, you guys and the young people that are at the point of making decisions of what's coming up next, take a close look of the pe to the people that you're gonna be involved with, that you'll be influenced by. Because after you leave the school here, I think that's the, fin the finishing touches on who you're going to become as, a, as an adult. And if there's one additional word of recommendation I can make to, to you guys as a group, in addition to a, put together a routine that I talked about, find out who you're going to be involved with. Find out who's going to influence you. And if they, if you make a little checklist and they meet the criteria, you're probably going down the right path with that. So before Steve and I get into some questions about. Uh, What's going on down at Fenway? Uh, to what we're trying to do with runners to score position, which is elusive. We've had it for a few nights, and we're still trying to get at it. Um, you know, when, when Steve asked me to, to come in and speak to, to you people, to, to the group here tonight, uh, you know, making some notes and putting some things together, it was a chance for me to reflect not only on my dad, God rest his soul, 10 years now, um, but to kind of think back of some of the stops along the way. And fortunately, to be in this game that we, we are fans of, or working in, or directly involved in, uh, it's an incredible opportunity. We have seven countries represented in our clubhouse, from Japan to Venezuela to the Dominican, uh, Canada, obviously the States. <laughs> And what is really cool, when you've got language barriers, you've got cultural barriers, there's one thing that keeps us all together, and that's the game. And whether or not Junichi Tozawa can speak in English to get a concept, which he can't. <laughs> but he knows every play on, on the field, so when you know Xander Bogart's here converging on a bunt play, and they've come from worlds apart, it's still the same game. It's brought everyone from all these different places together. And, and it's really a unique uh, and really cool opportunity to be involved in that. Um, regardless, like I said, regardless of where they come from, the frustrations that the game creates or the, or, or the, you know, the, the success that we're able to enjoy, it, it's really cool to see that crossover of cultures come together in one place and we're fortunate to be involved in it. So, um, Steve, we can, 
get together, you know, talk about anything. Can you hear me okay? Um, before we take questions from you people, I have a couple of my own. And by way of explanation, I'm going to point out the important role that Reading High School played in the Red Sox winning the World Series last year. But before I get to that, I'll tell you that the best part about my job is, and I've told this to people, interns and young writers for years, is that the really, really cool thing is you never know who you meet at the very, very beginning of your career who will play important roles in your career later on. Later on. And I always use the example of Billy Swift, who played in the big leagues. When I was in Maine, my first job up there was covering high schools. I covered Billy Swift at South Portland High School. I got promoted. I became a college baseball writer. I covered Billy Swift at the University of Maine, at the College World Series in 82. I think Oklahoma State was there in 82 with Dennis Livingston. <clears throat> then I got my first big league job. I covered the Seattle Mariners in 1987. Billy Swift was playing for the Seattle Mariners. I went to Billy's wedding. So <laughs> this little skinny high school kid was actually an outfielder that became an important part of my life as my career philosophy. So I tell you about years ago when my late brother who lived in Reading coached Reading Little League and he knew the Langone family. Paul and Melinda Langone and they had a little kid named Stephen Langone who was like this big when I first met him. He was playing for the New England Mariners, is that what it was called? And I got to know Steve Langone very well. Uh, can I introduce uh, Melinda and Paul Langone? Can you please stand up? These are the parents of the Red Sox and Red Sox, Steve Langone. So, John, I will start you off with the ultimate 81 mile an hour fastball Del Tide. Tell us about the role that Steve Langone has played as the advanced scout of the Red Sox, please. We, we have a, a separate department, a separate scouting department that covers our upcoming opponents. So tomorrow we've got a three-game series opening up against the Minnesota Twins. Uh, their son Steve has been out with the Twins in Detroit for the last four or five days, scouting them as they come into Boston. Tomorrow at 1.30, uh, and, and I'll back up a second. Over the last couple of days, we get a free reminder of the upcoming opponent filled with information, statistical information, written reports, all, on, on every player, on team overview, all, all this. So after Steve's last four days, five days in Detroit covering the Twins, we'll have a conference call with him for about 45 minutes to an hour tomorrow afternoon, and he'll kind of download all the subjective information that he scouted for the days that he spent with the Twins. We then take all that information in combination with um, what our other coaches have done. But Steve's eyes, uh, what he has seen from um, the last time we were over in Minnesota, uh, Kendra Morales, who just signed, was not with him. So I can tell you just a highlight. Tomorrow's call at 1.30, we'll spend quite a bit of time on what Steve has been seeing from Kendra Morales. This is a guy that didn't sign, he was out, didn't go to spring training because of the draft rules. Anyway, not to get all discombobulated on that. This is the player that we haven't seen the first time around. Steve's report tomorrow will give us a profile of what he's doing well, what he's not doing well, how we might exploit him. So Steve's got somewhat of a thankless job, and, and it's a pivotal one, but he's behind the scenes, he's out in front of our schedule all the time. Uh, I think he's had, we've now played 66 games. I think he's had, what, maybe two days off in the last, two and a half months. Uh, so once he's done, then he's, and, and tomorrow, or after he has that call with us tomorrow, he's already watching the Oakland A's starting tomorrow because then we have a four game series against them starting on Thursday. So his schedule is three or four days ahead of ours. That includes flights, East Coast, West Coast, wherever that team might be that he's got to go catch them. So he's got a demanding and challenging job and he's done a great job for us. So you did a great job, Ray. <laughs> You have uh, Brandon Worth in the pitch today, pitched very well. You have Felix DeBron in the DL, Buckholz pitched uh, down in the the other day. I'm not going to ask you to reveal how those things yeah, are shake out. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm on the clock tomorrow, I will. But uh, just to give us some background, when those moves are made, you'll have to find room for Clay Buckholz. You'll have to find room for Felix DeBron. And you've got Worth in the rotation. You've got some really good young prospects. Triple A, Double A, Henry Owens, the lefty. When those moves are made, 
Are they made by Ben? Are they made in concert with you? One of the others, your pitching coach? How, how does it all shake out? How, how are these moves made? Uh, any, anytime we've got, and we've got a unique set of circumstances coming up. Steve mentioned Buckholz and Dubron on rehab. We're going to get the suspension uh, handed down on Workman probably Monday or Tuesday. We're going to take him out of his next start. Um, but anytime we have movement back and forth from Pawtucket to Boston, uh, there, there are probably four people that are involved. And, and obviously Ben leads it. Mike Hazen, who's his assistant general manager, is his assistant. Uh, myself, and then Ben Crockett, who's a farm director. Because ultimately, when the conversations take place, then it's put in motion with a call to Ben Crockett, and then he takes care of it with his staff at Pawtucket, or the pitching coordinator, and so there, there's, that dialogue is going on right now. That dialogue has been going on the last couple of days. It, it continued after the game today, uh, because Dubron pitched on a minor league rehab assignment today, pitched six innings, or excuse me, five innings, struck out 10, uh, which was an important step for him because the two starts previous, he wasn't putting himself in a position to be a candidate to come back for workman start on Friday at Oakland. Now he's put himself in that spot. Uh, Alan Webster is another power right arm, power right hander at Pawtucket, who's another candidate. Ultimately, though, when you bring a guy up, a guy's got to go down. Um, and in the case, this is a unique case because with workman suspension, We'll go from a 25-man roster down to 24 for those four days or five days. We can't replace them. We have to play a man short. That's some of the challenge. We get into bench clearing brawls, and, and all of a sudden the warning has been issued. When you look to retaliate, you've got to take all these things into account. You're going to lose a guy in the roster for a period of time. So when whatever pitcher is selected to take work from the spot, we've got to send another guy out to create that room. So we've got to get down to 23 and then add the pitcher coming up to get back to 24. And then the day after that start is made, next Friday, that pitcher is likely to go out, or could be someone else to go out, to put Workman back on the roster. So it's, there's a number of moves, but there's four to five people that are uh, always in a conversation with that. But those conversations begin probably five or six days prior to begin to work through all the different scenarios. So, when you pick up the transactions or you read the headline that you know Joe Smith is coming to the major leagues for Jim Smith, there's probably been four or five days of lead up talk and conversation. Who has questions? We have microphones here and here. So if anybody has a question, why don't you line up with this microphone over here and this one over here? Don't be shy, this is what we're here for. If not, go ahead, you sir first. All right. Um, you mentioned Brandon Workman. You play to, uh, Tampa Bay. The price hits, blocks three guys all year. He throws the other guy. Workman throws behind him. He couldn't have been intentionally thrown behind him. Why didn't he drill him? You guys are tough. Well, the moral of the story was he was trying. And he missed it. <laughs> That's why he got suspended. <laughs> Not because he missed it, <laughs> but because the warning had been issued. You followed enough to where after a warning, if someone's thrown at, if there's intent deemed by the umpire, you get fined, you get suspended, and that's what we're working through. Okay. You missed it. Uh, yeah, it didn't have another chance. <laughs> Somebody over here want to ask a question? Really, 400 people? Go ahead. Come on up here. Hi, John. Uh, welcome to Reading. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate you uh, coming out. Um, my son's in Little League, and uh, probably plenty of others here. I'm real concerned about pitchers' arms. And I know the Major League uh, Baseball Network had a roundtable recently on uh, maybe some changes that might be needed physically to the game, mound heights and stuff. I was just wondering what advice you had for, uh, for young pitchers now, knowing what you're seeing. You know, you've been around for a while. Um, First of all, I don't think you can throw a long toss on the And how old your son? 10, 12? Yeah, I've got a 10 and a 12 year old. Now, obviously, age related distances are, are going to be important for this. Um, so if, if a 10 year old can throw you know, 100 to 120 feet maximum, maybe more, I think the key is what's the trajectory of the throw? You don't want to be throwing fly balls just to get.
get there, but there's got to be a little bit of a little bit of air underneath it. I firmly believe that you you keep an arm in shape, you gain strength by using it and throwing it in long time, and that requires pop, proper footwork. Um, you know, just getting some momentum going with a crow hop and all that. So for a 10 to 12 year old, if you're if you're, if you're playing long toss, anywhere from 100. And, 15 to 130 feet, somewhere in there, I think that's probably adequate for distance. Um, this year, and as we're on this topic, with the Tommy John surgeries, the number of Tommy John surgeries that have taken place this year, I don't think, I might run counter to the, uh, maybe the, the thought that might be out there. I don't think it's volume related. I don't think it's as much related to the number of pitches, for, for major league pitchers, inside of a given house. Now, at his age, before his arm is fully developed and you know the growth plates have yet to close up, you know, you've got to adhere to strict pitch counts, I think. And that might be anywhere from 50 to 60 pitches inside of one game. And then you've got to give yourself probably three days rest before you come back from that. So without taking those numbers verbatim or, or making them gospel, I think anytime you get into you know, a, a youth player, 10 to 12 year old player, and he's getting over 75 pitches, you're probably starting to fatigue him to the point where it's putting more stress on the league. So many people think that the way young players have been overworked or overpitched is a precursor or sets them up for injury later on down the line. Could possibly be. Could possibly be. You play any other sports? Yeah, my sons also do uh, football. Whatever you do, I, don't specialize. That would be one of my other recommendations. Don't just go into baseball solo. You've got to play, oh, your arm needs a break. I refer to pitchers as racehorses. And after the racing season's over, they put them out on the farm, they let them walk around, and they heal up. A pitcher's got to do the same thing. So by playing other sports, you're developing yourself in other ways. Uh, you're getting away from thro your, your throwing arm being used so much. So fast forward down to the major league side, when all the injuries are being taken place, I think it's because of the, everything is centered around velocity. If you don't throw 95, you, you probably don't get looked at to get to the big leagues, which to me is crazy. You know, we have a seven man bullpen, and we have two guys that throw over 94 miles an hour. We have five other guys that throw from 88 to 92, but they pitch. They chase speeds, they locate, they create a little action on the, on the baseball. The guys that get hurt to me are the guys that are getting so big and so strong and are generating so much velocity, their arms can't take it. So when you see 15 guys in spring training go down with Tommy John, where they haven't built up yet enough, it can't be volume. It's force. So they're getting, they're so strong and they're centered around so much velocity that their arms are flying apart. In that round table, they talked about maybe reducing the height of the mound from the current 10 inches I think it was 1975, they took it from 14 inches down to 10 inches. And there's talk of taking it down to 6 inches, which would increase offense, the forces on the elbow and other parts of the body with the slope and the angle would be lessened, so maybe increase longevity or, or reduce injury. These are, these are possibilities, no one knows. But the arm, arm care, long toss is the most important thing. Um, and, and get back to you know, a 10 or 12 year old, again, a good pro hop in a 115, 130 foot feet of distance is, is recommended. But to just start pitching without conditioning your arm, I think you're starting to set yourself up for possible injury as well. Other question? Oh, go ahead. How do you like measure? How, like, how do you measure who's going to bat first and last and in the middle of the order? Good question. We look at it, you know, the guys that get on base with the highest rate, they're the guys you want to getting the most at bats. You know, so many people will talk about, well, you've got to score runs. Well, the, the lead into scoring runs is getting on base. So typically the guy in the, in the leadoff spot is one of your high on base percentage players. It's not necessarily your fastest. So many people think, well, you've got to be a base stealer to, to hit leadoff. Not necessarily. We've got to get you on base ahead of other really good hitters that hopefully drive you in. So if you look at our lineup, and if you look at on base percentage, 
you probably see it in a descending order from the one hole to the nine hole. And, and that's kind of the way things line up. Now, left-handed, right-handed, you try to create some alternate back and forth so as the opposing manager is using his bullpen, you don't want them to be able to go in and get three left-handers in a row or three right-handers in a row. You try to alternate it enough to take advantage of right and left. Good question. Other questions? Yes, sir. Question for you. How long does it typically take for you to assess uh, where, where a player may be as far as, you know, as far as position wise? So, like, for example, ball bats. How long does it take you to say, hey, you know what, he maybe isn't fit to be a shortstop, maybe he's fit to be a third baseman, or maybe he's fit to get outfield because of the size? How long does it take for you to kind of give him a gauge? Like, as far as the PD went from shortstop to, to second base? That, that evaluation on where a player's ultimate position is going to be starts the day he signs his pro contract and comes through the minor leagues. Uh, the higher players go, the speed of the game gets faster because you're talking about increased strength. Um, we thought early on, I say we, this year, looking at this year, in Xander's case, um, it was kind of a split camp. Can he stay at shortstop? Does he need to move to another position? The one thing that we also have to factor in is history, because each year in the minor leagues, he was a, he's been a slow starter, and as he's gotten into the flow of the season, defensively he becomes more relaxed, offensively he starts to take off. So as we were going through that first four to six weeks of the season, we were seeing the same things. But there's a little bit more sense of urgency here at our level than in Portland. So, we felt like there might be the need to, to move him off the position. Just so happens, the 10 days prior to Stephen Drew joining us, he starts to take off offensively, just as history has shown. His defense at shortstop began to become more efficient. I think a lot of that has to do with starting to read swings. And what I mean by that is a guy at shortstop, he's gonna see where their a pitch is intended to be located. You start to see how hitters are dressing those, and you start to anticipate your first step, either right or left, even before contact is made. So he started to get in flow of, of that part of the game at the major level. And where he might not be the fastest guy, he started to anticipate moves, and started to anticipate first step moves that allowed him to cover more ground, particularly to his glove side. So to sit here today and say at 21 years of age, he's got to move to another position, I'm not that, I don't know that anybody's that good. You've got to let it play out. Um, you know, he's 6'3", 190 pounds, so it, when he's 26 years old and he adds another 20 pounds, he might need to move to the corner. But you let that play out. So a good question. I mean, that, that, those are questions that go on in the scouting room, in the amateur scouting world, 24-7. Projection. Where is where's the guy going to go to? What's he going to become? You, you never fully know that. That's one of the beauties, particularly this sport. You don't have to be a certain height. You don't have to be a certain weight. You don't have to run a certain speed to be successful. It's not like football, basketball, or other sports where, you know, that's what makes this one really cool. John, quick question for me. Um, and I did some research on this. I know Dustin Pedroia was drafted as a shortstop at Arizona State. Bogarts was a shortstop. Hope came up as a shortstop. Uh, I found out where Middlebrooks played shortstop. I'm going to guess that pretty much every right-handed burrow on your team, <coughs> including your pitchers, played shortstop at one point because it's the, it's the talent position. Right. We, so the question is, at some point, many, many years ago, did you play shortstop? Me? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I hit 220 in high school. <laughs> I played first base and pitched. I, mean, I, I was terrible. Um, <laughs> but you brought up, you brought up, you bring up an interesting point because this goes back to the question on Bogarts as well. And when we told him, when I, I had to sit and meet with him, when I had made him aware that we were signing Stephen Drew, he had a hard time with that because as players go through the minor leagues and they come to the big leagues, they view themselves a certain way, and that includes the position they play. Well, when he was told he was going to move off, I, I don't know, you probably remember the game, a couple of errors. You know, it, it didn't sit well. And it was the guys you just mentioned. It was Pedroia, it was Wood Middlebrooks, it was Brock Holt, uh, might have been Johnny Gomes. They were, they were all shortstops. At some point, they moved. It was like, hey, man, no big deal. In this case, it could potentially be for a half a season. 
and you go back to the position. So it was as much, you know, I was, I, I was a player. I didn't evaluate myself accurately. Players never evaluate themselves accurately. Their ego gets in the way. They have, but they have to have the ego to be the, for the feeling of being invincible. That's where some of those candid conversations come in that they don't necessarily set too well with the individual player. But after time, they might see it a little bit more. So as those guys you mentioned said, Sandy, no big deal. We all had to move. Just move. And I think the fact that his teammates, it became a little bit more settling in this one. The next night, he went out and a heck of a game, and it can play great sense. So sometimes it's just realizing where you are in a point in time and not fight it. You mentioned Brock Cole. He's moved around a lot. When did you project him to be able to play in the outfield, left field, right field? You just wake up someday and say, let's play Brock over here because he's hitting you well? Or when he came up, did you know that he might be moving around? Yeah, we'd love to say, yeah, we knew all along. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, 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 as a matter of fact, with Brock playing third base uh, when before Steven Drew joined us and after Middlebrooks broke his finger, Napoli was on the still on the DL. So Drew comes to us and, and Brock was getting his, his at bats. He started to, you know, we started to put him in a leadoff spot because that was a little bit of a revolving door for a while. Uh, he fit a little bit of the profile. You know, he got on base, left-handed hitter, they could also hit left-handed pitching. Could run. He was hitting leadoff for us. Now he's starting to get a couple hits a night. Now we're starting to think, okay, these other guys are starting to come back to us. We got to keep him in the lineup. He had never played first base before. Stuck him at first base in Cleveland for a series. Makes two or three backhand plays. Plays well there. Napoli's coming back on our first day in Detroit, or, or no, it was the final day in Detroit. So you know, Holt is playing four or five days at first base. Napoli comes back, says, so okay, where are we going to put him now? Well, let's take him in left field against right-handed pitching because you know, our outfield hasn't been the most powerful. We stick him in left field, having never played the outfield before, makes a couple of running catches. And like, you know what? The more we keep throwing at this kid, the more he's just answering the bell. So we, we didn't have any clue other than he was a good athlete and he was a smart player. He made good decisions in, inside the lines. Other than that, we just kind of threw him out there. And you know what, he makes two really good plays in right field yesterday to, to save 90 feet. And sometimes, like I said, it goes back to not just the talent of the player, but the person, the person inside it. So we trust him. We trust his decision making, we trust his athletic skills, and we're willing to take some bumps along the way because of an experience. But he's doing a, he's doing a great job. So it was really the day before. I'm curious on your thoughts on the shift. It used to be, uh, Rarely used primarily on Ortiz. Now it seems to be more, becoming more predominant. And aren't you tempted to have David lay a bump down that above the baseline once in a while? He actually tried, we were bowling with him the other night, he actually tried to bunt, which he's done a couple of times. After watching him attempt to bunt, even though he'd <laughs> rather, we'll take our chance with him hitting into the shift or hitting the ball to the ballpark rather than try to bunt down the third baseline. Um, over the last two years, the number of shifts employed around the game have, I think two years ago, and I, I know I don't have this number right, but I want to say teams shifted like 1,200 times. About the course of the season, all 30 teams. This year, it's on a pace to exceed 8,000. So there, there's, there's more people willing to use the information that's available to every team. Um, and I think it's one of, the re one of the reasons, one of the contributing factors as to why offense is down. Hitters haven't adjusted yet to either bunt or change their swing to hit against the shift. So you're taking the, the hard contact or the hitter's natural swing and you're just trying to take it away. And it's being taken away more than it's forcing guys to go the other way. Does Ortiz bunt? He does. Bunting batting practice at 50 miles an hour versus bunting 95 coming at you is a little different. <laughs> I mean, good question, though, because that's the next step. The guys are going to, you know, Santana, who's a power hitter himself, tried to bunt earlier today. You know, he, he pushed a bunt foul, ended up striking out two pitches later. So, until. Uh, true. Uh, someone might. 
Stand up, good boys. Do I do the trading? No. <laughs> Thank you. That's the trade. And this guy. Yes. Are we going to see uh, the great clay buckles again? We are. Uh, and he's got at least one more rehab start, uh, which will be Thursday, uh, and then come back to us. But while the, while the line score numbers might not have been the strongest yesterday, um, you know, no walks of the 96. The physical side of it is making the right steps and getting back here. So we're hopeful he's going to be re rejoining us after one more start of the time. Way back here, John, how are you doing now? Thank you for coming. Uh, two questions. One, as a, an ex pitcher and a car manager, how do you feel about the DH role? And my young daughter wants to know if you're friends with Wally. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm friends with him, I see him every day. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I'm a, I like the American League style of game. Um, I never pitched in the National League. I might have a different view had I played there. I will say going into National League ballparks uh, and playing the National League style, it's more, it, it's, there's more to contend with, there's more decisions to be made at that point in the lineup or certain points in the game. Uh, but I think it's a more exciting game to have the DH being used, particularly the DH like ours, um, which is a dying breed, I will tell you. David Ortiz, the, the, that type of player, that, that's not being sought as much anymore because they're trying to, they try to, teams try to use that DH spot as a resting spot. To rotate guys through, get guys off their feet, and yet keep their bat in the lineup. I'm sure if they had a hitter of David's abilities, they'd think otherwise. But, no, I, I'm, I'm much more of a fan of the DH. Just as an aside, Bobby Cox would have been for the Braves, and you wouldn't have known this because you were with Cleveland and other teams, would routinely take his DH in interleague games and put him in the field and basically give up the DH. And he did it five, six, seven times over the course of a couple of years, and he said, this is the way I manage. And to him, the DH was take a guy, put him in a DH, okay, now I want to do this, so I'm going to put my DH in the third base, I'm going to give up the DH, he was just, it meant not about the man. I find that fascinating. Which, a National League team is constructed very different than an American League team. And you get role players that are accustomed to pinch hitting. They probably have two or three Johnny Gomes on their bench versus ours. Yep. So the ability to call upon that guy to come off the bench and pinch hit, that, that's, we feel at a much greater disadvantage going into a National League ballpark than a National League team coming into an American League ballpark. Our teams aren't built the same. Uh, right here. You talked a little bit, you spoke about you know, the binder that you get beforehand, uh, you know, all the data, the spray charts, the cameras in the, in the day now. Can you talk a little bit about managing through, you know, versus money ball, big data, you know, kind of the tension between you know, Ben Charrington and, and everything that you have there versus actually managing the game? Uh, the question was, does statistical information influence managing or, or how is that all that information used uh, at field level, to summarize? Um, I, I use the, the stat world information to construct, was the, was the question on the lineup, uh, to construct today's lineup to plan out, so if I know what, the, we, we know three days in advance of a series coming up, who the starting pitchers against us are going to be. So I will map out days of rest for those who need it based on certain performance numbers on that type of pitcher. Not, maybe not specifically that exact pitcher, but a pitcher of similar style. We get projections every series of what every hitter will do against a certain pitcher on, on the opposing team. I'll glance at that, I'll use that as one piece of information to map out the, the playing time. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. Let's say we have a right-handed pitcher, Max Scherzer, going against us, who's had more difficulty against left-handed hitters. But John Lester is pitching that night, and David Ross works better with John Lester than maybe A.J. Kaczynski. That's not to be critical. That means there's a rapport, or there's the human element, that has really filtered into those two guys working together on the mound and behind the plate. I'll take the offensive performance, the left-handed hitting catcher against Max Scherzer, 
and put that aside to prioritize the human side of it, and that's Lester and Ross working in concert. That's where that comes into play. Now, in the seventh inning, when we've got a pinch hit move or we've got a, a, a move to make on the bullpen, if I don't work through these, so at three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm kind of walking through the potential matchups that might be later that night. If I don't think through those and just wait for it to unfold, I'm chasing my tail. So I've got all the information boiled down to one card, all the matchup information, all that. So in my mind, I'm trying to think an inning ahead because that pitcher down the bullpen, he needs lead time. He needs 18, 20 throws to be loose to face the hitter that you want. So the game is going on, but in my mind, I'm another inning ahead already to, to anticipate the moves that might be needed. So you, you study that stat information leading into a series or leading into a particular game, but then when it's happening, because not every pitcher might be available that night because they need extra rest, or they pitch two consecutive days and we don't want to go to third consecutive day. So all those things, all those things are weeded through to leave you with option A or option B when it's when it's hitting the fan in the seventh grade. Before we get the next question, it's one just a quick follow up for me. In spite of all the statistical data that you have that absolutely positively tells you this is the move you need to make, do you ever every once in a while go screw it and, and go with the guy? <laughs> yeah, we did that in the World Series. Um, there, was, there was an intangible that I thought Johnny Gomes brought to our team. Uh, Daniel Nava, and I remember meeting with Daniel in the outfield saying, you know what, if this were July and we've got two right-handed starters coming against us these next two days, you'd be in the lineup every one of those games. But I couldn't look past the fact that we had won, we were seven and one in the postseason in games in which Johnny Gomes had started. Did he get a base hit every time up? No, but he brought, he did get some key hits. No bigger than the three of home in St. Louis, but there was an intangible that was there, and I felt we projected a completely different feel across the field, a different attitude, a different group. There was something different about us when he was in the lineup. So with that in mind, there was, there was a more of a gut feel that I went with rather than what the numbers showed. Believe me, the airwaves were taking that as liberty to just cut and slice and slash, whatever. That's what makes working here so great. Great <laughs> uh, question. Uh, one of you, Steve, for those who may not be uh, ball players, but they're interested in media side thing, what would you give for advice to some of the kids out there? You know, you talk about being a cub reporter and that sort of stuff, but the, with media and digital, everything's changed quite a bit. For those who are thinking about it, what piece of advice from some of the other people? want to be players or writers? Oh, right. Because <laughs> if you want to be players, you came to the wrong place. I was voted worst athlete in the 20th century in Cambridge and High Latin. Um, uh, my, my advice would be a right. Right is right. Uh, John talked about long toss. And I, I think the most important thing, two things, number one is, is to write. If it's a journal, if it's a, an online blog or something like that, if you write, the art of writing repeats itself and you pick up new things. And the other thing is to be, have a diverse portfolio. Don't limit yourself to baseball. The, the very best baseball writers have a way of weaving contemporary themes, a, a movie, a book, a quote from some, somebody else who's not part of baseball. And it just makes the game story that you read. Some of the best baseball writers, and I've, I've, I've been in the game 36 years, and I, I learned from guys like Joe Gigliotti from the old Herald, the record America. Peter Gammon used to vacation up in Maine, and uh, you, you'll love this. I'm sitting in the office in Portland, Maine, one day, and I get a phone call from Peter Gammon, and I'm 24, 25 years old. I'm covering the college baseball. I'm covering the new Maine Black Bears. And Peter Gammons calls me, and he, and he made it seem like we just talked an hour before. He says, Steve, Peter Gammons, listen, I was wondering, you wrote this thing about Billy Swift and Stu Lockignata, and, and can you give me some of those stats? And I'm like, this is Peter Gammons. <laughs> I'm 24 years old, so it was a, it was a big deal. And, uh, and, and Peter was one of those guys who used to, and, and I read Peter as a, as a high school kid, if you can believe that, and, and Peter would bring in rock rock music references, and old movies, Humphrey Bogart references, and, and stuff like that. And if you want to be strictly a, a baseball 
nuts and bolts, saber guy, just right about baseball from a statistical analysis point of view, that's great, and, and the internet's filled with those. But if you want to appeal to a mass audience, as, as, and I'm a columnist, my job is to tell him when he screws up. And, and the beat writers are there to rub his back and, and, and get those that columnists like Shaughnessy, Bob Ryan, me, Jack McMullen, we're the opinionators. We're, we're the people that stirs the pot a little bit. It's, uh, and I'm a lover of baseball. I was a baseball beat writer for many years, and I, I still have a deep in the belly love of baseball, but I'm a columnist now, so it's a bit different. But if you can weave contemporary themes in it, uh, it, it helps a lot. So, but this is about me. So. All right, yes, Coach. Coach, you talk about the importance of role players. You mentioned role players. But at all levels, how important it is to be have role players on the team and how young kids can learn to accept um, maybe not being the starting second baseman or the starting you know, center fielder or batting third, um, and still feeling like a productive member of the team in the program. Uh, the question was the importance of role players, uh, and you know th this topic or conversation could really apply to anything. But the fact that we're talking about baseball, obviously. Um, I think the thing that separated us from most every team last year was our, was our bench, was our role players. Uh, and that to me requires a couple things. Uh, it requires a guy to take his ego and put it aside. It requires him to think the game or think the situation and try to be one step ahead of it or in Johnny Gomes' case or in Mike Karp's case or now Jonathan Herrera's case. They're managing the game in their own mind because they know what their routine is to warm up and get ready, so they've got to anticipate some things along the way. I think it's critical that when you're dealing with someone who is a role player, you've got to be candid with them, you've got to be honest with them, and you've got to be able to have those, maybe those tough conversations with them because the biggest challenge we have is where the individual goals and the team's goals butt heads. And if you don't have a role player that's willing to put his own personal goals aside, he's going to have a hard time accepting that role. So we were fortunate to identify a group of players that when they came through the door, they checked their ego at the door. And I think all of us in here, at some level, we want to be part of something bigger that's, a, that's bigger than us. We, you, know, you want to be part of something that you can be part of that's bigger than you. And I think we had, we had so many guys last year that lived and breathed that, that were part of a group that really could achieve something special. We weren't the best team. We weren't the most talented team. But we were, we were a team in, the, in that very sense that they love to compete, they love to work together, and they love to compete as a group against another team. And it was interesting to hear the conversations in the dugout. They can sense the individualists. They can sense the individual players. And when they were on that other team, they knew they had them beat because at some point in that game, their individual approach or their individual goal to be what they could get for themselves was gonna take away from the team. They, they, they talked about it. They, players have reputations, let's face it. Players have reputations of how they go about their work, how they go about the game. And it was never daunting to this group that we had last year and most of this team this year. They, they didn't, you know, the, the big names never intimidated them because at some point they knew they would overcome as a group. They knew there was power in numbers. They knew there was a cohesiveness and that momentum that started wasn't going to be stopped. But along the way, we had to make sure that the guys that were those role players, we communicated with them constantly because you empathize with the fact that they could probably start for other teams but yet they were sacrificing in some ways of being on our team in the role that they had. So that is a great question because everyone wants to be the guy. Everyone wants to be the headliner. And that's where sometimes the player, I've mentioned this before, player self-evaluation is never accurate. Every player thinks they're better than that. And they have to, they have to think that way. That's where those candid conversations have to really be had and not, you know, not push aside or avoid. I think we have time for like two more questions. So you got your hand up first uh, yeah. back there. So we'll go with you. Uh, you mentioned earlier Tom Sawyer was a uh, senior. Tom um, Sawyer is also Tom a senior. Tom Sawyer is your uh, role model. Do right? you have the same thing now for, as a coach? Like you said, these are the role models I've had or continue to have as a coach? 
Um, probably, not, I, w I would say <laughs> yes, but there, there's a huge difference. I would, I, not that I'm not impressionable now, but I think to emulate a certain style, that, that's what Tom Seaver afforded me. I try to watch, even, so many people ask, okay, you got a night off last night, what'd you do? I'll, I'll watch other games. I'll watch situations that arise in a certain game, how, what were decisions that were made? So you start to see different styles of managers that you might be able to pick up on or you might take something from a certain situation and maybe you find it becomes of use um, in the game that you're working with. Steve mentioned Doc Edwards. He was my first major, he was a, my first manager, he was a manager in Old Orchard Beach, but then he was my first manager at the major level. What he made me feel like was, a, was his own son. And that was, he had the ability to put his arm around you because the, your mind is racing. When you come to the big leagues the first time, the emotions are, they're, they're racing. And you're finding a way to calm down. He had a calming effect about him that made you feel like everything was gonna be okay. He's kind of a good old boy. He was a, he was a gentle giant, but he had a way of just kind of putting things at ease. And that's the one thing when you see a young, when I have a young player come in, I'll always sit down with him first in the office. Then I'll see him in the dugout and I'll find a way to just, you know, put a hand on their shoulder, just, just so that they're able to, maybe their heart rate slows down a little bit. And you, you, know, you, you begin now I'm in a position where I'm living vicariously through a guy starting his major league career. It's, it's really cool to see. But you're trying to pull from, what did the past managers have an effect on me and how can I pass that on to this situation? So Doc Edwards was the one just in, kind of letting you settle in and get your feet on the ground. Just a, a quick question for me, and uh, we'll get two more. You, you talk about bringing every new kid in your office. I, I'm just curious now, having heard you say that, Alex Hassan is from Milton, I believe, and grew up in Fenway Park. Was, was it a bit different with him? Was, was he as calm, cool, and collected as the next rookie who comes up? Or given his own personal history, did you have to, like, hose him down? <laughs> Hell no, he wasn't calm. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, his first start in Fenway, I, I can't imagine how many people he had in the stands. He probably had 35, 40 people or whatever in the stands. So, you can, I mean, you, for those who, who deal with people and manage people, you begin to read their body language pretty quick. And in, in Alex's case, it was, you know, it's the, the wide-eyed kid. That maybe the eyes might be a little bit wider because of wearing the hometown uniform and playing in the hometown ballpark. Um, and that's where, because it's so obvious how the anxiety level was pretty high, which is natural, you spend a little bit more time talking about what you were before you got here. Just because you're here now doesn't mean you have to be more. You stay, you're, you get called up because of the things that you've been doing. Young players fall in the trap of, okay, now I'm in the major leagues, I've gotta be better than I was or try to do more. That's when they really get in trouble. And that's when they get in trouble from a performance. It's just, God, it's, you, you want to make them feel relaxed as best you can. Knowing that as soon as they step in the batter's box, they, he probably couldn't feel his knees. He probably couldn't feel his body. <laughs> I can remember being on the mound the first time. Yeah, I, I was shaking. I mean, li visibly, literally shaking. My first two pitches in the major leagues were two base hits. I did two pitches. I had Paul Molitor and Robin Yams. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, it can't get any worse when it started. I was actually going to mention that because we did a story last summer on guys getting called up from the big leagues. And were you sick or something? I'm trying to remember what the story was you told me. You get called up from the big leagues. I was in Buffalo. Um, I had gotten food poisoning on a Sunday. The team flew to Nashville that next morning. <coughs> we scheduled to fly that next morning on, on Monday. I missed Monday because I was still sick. I flew to met the team on Tuesday in Nashville. I come to the hotel, I get a call from the, man, from the manager, who's Steve Swisher, Nick Swisher's dad, uh, who's, who hit the game winning home last day. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how this stuff all is connected. He calls me to his room, and he goes, um, you just got here, right? I said, yeah, just checked in the hotel. He goes, well, somebody went to the ballpark to get your bag, you're going to Cleveland. I'm like, going to Cleveland? I said, yeah, you got called up. Which, again, when you first hear it, you, you, you can't believe it. End up getting called up, end up pitching that night. 
uh, in the 10th inning in, out of the bullpen. I never really performed pro baseball. So talking about Brock Holt when he was thrown in different positions, here it was. Doug Jones was our closer at the time. Pitches the ninth, uh, the ninth and the 10th. I pitched the 11th. I was the last guy sitting in the bullpen going, there's nobody else left. I must be in this game. It's not decided one way or the other. Lo and behold, two pitches in, first and second. Find a way to get out of it, get out of it. Pat Tabler with a base is loaded, base hit. We, we walk it off in the 11th. And I was in the major leagues about five hours and we win. <laughs> <laughs> and the first two batters you face with future Hall of Famers. Yeah. That's, that's great. Uh, the White Cat, last question, lay over there. Can, can you hypothetical question. Game seven of the World Series, I have a choice of picking any pitcher to give uh, the ball to to start that night. Wow. That list is going to probably get weeded down to a handful. Um, John Lester would be in, of current pitchers. Yeah, John Lester's in that group for sure. Green all lifetime in the World Series. Um, I just said pro red side. <laughs> Chris Sale, you know, I you spent just some recent time on the DL, but Chris Sale is, he's in a very select group with Type of stuff and then velocity, the action. Um, he's another one. Um, and I'd even throw an older guy in here too. What Tim Hudson is doing right now is really remarkable. Uh, just a, a model of consistency, a great pitcher. Um, I'd probably put Wayne Wright in that same group. Wayne Wright, Hudson, Lester, Sales. See if I can come up with one more here. I'm not a fan of the Tampa Rays, so I can't pick any of the He plays with us. Obviously, Max Scherzer. Max Scherzer would probably be the shoe as well. Good question. In closing, when uh, we talked earlier this year, I got to my old school books, and I found your first start to play, and I wanted to amuse you with this stat. I, I believe the first guy he faced, was, he reached E196 out at second base, and then no sooner did I tell you, the, the first guy he faced, he hit a ground ball, he soon get through the ball on the right field line, right field looked through the shortstop, the guy trying to advance. Uh, and that's not why I bring it up, but I bring it up for it is because you corrected some small point that I made. And I'm just wondering, do you remember all of this stuff? And do people generally who are in baseball become big league managers? Is that part and parcel of the whole? Is that part of the job that you have this stuff in your head all these years? Um, I don't remember it all, I can tell you that. Probably by choice. <laughs> but you remember that play, though. Yeah, well, I think the unique thing that because I think if, you, if this question could be asked probably to any player, and they would probably have similar recall, it's because we've lived it. We've actually physically gone through something. So we, it's not like we just read something and it's and it stayed there. We've actually gone through the physical action and felt the game. We've had to make a decision to make a play. Um, but yeah, I, I can tell you the four bats of Paul Molitor's game in 1988 on a rainy night in Milwaukee that shouldn't have been played because everything was rained out prior to the game and stopping his 39 game hitting streak that night. I can probably walk through every bat still in my mind, which was you know, 26 years ago. So we, we you know, I'm sure the guys in here that have played, you can go back to some of your games and, and you have a feel and a, an experience that you can, that you can talk about. The one guy that I, can, I, I will, as much as you bring that up, the guy that I marvel at that was was Jason Paratek. No doubt a photographic guy. We would have picture we would have picture meetings in advance of let's say the Yankees. And it's the third series we're playing against the Yankees. And we'll talk at the time let's say we're talking about Robinson Cano. And Schilling was talking about how he would get him out. And then would say, you know, back in the first series in New York, this is what I did. And Veritek would say, no, that's not how you did it. It was this sequence. 
in one at bat three months prior in the first at bat of game one of that series, the counts, the pitch, the location, I would just be blown away. The graphic detail that Veritech has. It's, and it's probably one of the reasons why he caught five no hitters because he could remember every pitch that was thrown from that pitcher that night and do different sequences to keep that hitter always guessing. It's remarkable. And because it's, you know, I think it goes back to people living the experience of being able to talk In closing, I'd like to point out that you know I'm his manager of the Red Sox, but I now attended countless banquets and dinners and lunches and Q&As and so forth. And I'm here to tell you that John Farrell's community outreach is second to nobody's as people who've worked for the Red Sox over the years. I've seen him at the Boston College, the baseball banquet, the baseball writers' dinner, his ability to, to uh, coexist in this town. Uh, it's obviously Terry Francona was here for eight years and he used to talk about how it's the toughest job in all of sports because there's no place to hide when you're the manager of the Red Sox. And as Terry used to always say, Everybody's played some baseball, and everybody can do it better than you can. <laughs> so, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you.